the first dimension, doctrinal penetration or awareness, that's faith. Then the conversion, that's hope. And then proclaiming the good news to others, that's charity. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Priest for an Apostolic Age podcast. I'm your host, Peter Androstic, Senior Consultant with the Evangelical Catholic. And I'm your co-host, Father Keith O'Hare from the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia. And today we're here again with Professor Douglas Bushman uh, talking about the theology of renewal for his church. One of my favorite subjects. I'm delighted to be here. Great. Awesome. So we're just going to continue in from last time. But before we do that, let's start with prayer. So, Peter and Professor Bushman, for the prayer, just taking a few lines from Pope Paul VI's general audience on August 5th, 1964. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Consciousness, renewal, and dialogue are the paths that today are opened before the living church. For Jesus, we are so blessed to be members of this living church, the church of the present day, your instrument for the evangelization of the whole world. Send your Holy Spirit so that this conversation might enlighten and inspire all of us to be instruments of the new evangelization in your living church, the church of Christ. Pope St. Paul the Sixth, pray, pray for, us. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. So Peter and Professor Bushman, we're continuing our conversation from last week's episode, and it really is all about the document that we priests never read in the seminary. That's the best way to title this conversation, part two, the document <laughs> we never read in the seminary and we should have read. So it's called Ecclesiam Suam, or the Paths of the Church. It's an encyclical of Pope Paul VI, which provides the hermeneutic, the interpretive key for Vatican Council II the event itself, and all the documents that, that it contains. So we're so grateful for your pursuit and your composition of this book, The Theology of Renewal for His Church, Ecclesiam Suum, His Church, Professor Bushman. And as I understand it from this document, this encyclical, which is also called The Paths of the Church, that's its other way of being um, titled in English, that there are three, the three paths of the church, and they have a relationship one with another. So Peter and I are really eager to hear your insights and thoughts about those three paths and particularly how we might see applications, practical applications in the life of the church and the life of the parish um, of those three paths. So we, the, the three paths, as you said, and uh, that was a beautiful prayer. Thank you. And uh, based on a really great one line kind of uh, here's what I want to say in this encyclical of Paul the Sixth. So the three paths are awareness or consciousness, and this means, by the way, John the Twenty Third called it doctrinal penetration. All right, and this is exactly what uh, John the uh, Paul the Sixth has in mind. So in his opening speech to the council, he said, "Our purpose here is to engage in a doctrinal penetration to understand the doctrine that Christ has revealed more deeply." Now, based on the principle from the one to more is given, more will be demanded. If you understand something more deeply, you're more accountable to live up to it. And so the first path naturally leads, especially Paul VI says, and for anyone who loves the church, to have a deeper understanding of her mystery is a call to conversion. And so doctrinal awareness or penetration automatically gives rise to all kinds of efforts to live up to the high calling uh, of holiness. So the first path leads to the second path. And then when sin is rooted more out of our lives, and this is an important point, Paul VI uses the word metanoia for the second path of renewal. So he's talking about personal conversion. He says, oh yes, uh, we will, he doesn't use this word, but I'm gonna use it to make a point. We'll fiddle with some of the institutional dimensions of the church. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the liturgy, we know uh, there were certain things that were restored in the liturgy, like what we called for a long time the RCIA, now the OCIA, uh, the permanent diaconate was restored. There were various things that the bishops thought that um, 
the, the church could uh, draw from her own history and tradition. Um, and, uh, and this is one of the reasons why Paul VI so often referred to Vatican II, according to the, the biblical uh, words of Jesus in um, Matthew 13, 52. Uh, Matthew 13 is a, a series of um, parables about the, uh, the kingdom of God. And Jesus says to the apostles, have you understood all of this? And they said, yes, we have. And then he says, well, uh, the kingdom of God is like a scribe who uh, is like a wise head of a household who knows how to bring out of his storehouse things both new and old. What a beautiful explanation for what we today call the hermeneutic of continuity. And so uh, there are some new things in Vatican II, but they're rooted in and come out of the old. And so, so that's what happened at Vatican II in, in the first part uh, of doctrinal penetration, bringing, uh, reminding ourselves of what's essential and um, getting such a deep understanding that we can rephrase things and update them based on the needs of the church today. Well, that greater knowledge is going to give rise to a deep conversion, um, and the fruit of that conversion will be a new evangelization of personal witness to God's love fully revealed in Jesus Christ. Now, I, I think priests might, might find it. So Paul VI never actually fully told us what the logic of the, the sequence is from doctrinal awareness to spiritual conversion, to new evangelization through dialogue. And so a good part of my book, I've got a whole chapter where I try to get inside his mind. And there's just a couple of things that, uh, that might serve uh, those who are listening to us. Um, I'm implementing one of the, the, the well-known uh, uh, principles of teaching, lead people to what they don't know through what they already know, okay? Everyone's familiar with the, um, uh, the Annunciation, the account of the Annunciation. Well, the Annunciation begins with a liturgy of the word. Uh, there, this is revelation for Mary, uh, but through Gabriel, um, she takes a deep doctrinal penetration. She penetrates into all of the promises of the Old Testament that are gonna be fulfilled in and through her, all right? And so God first makes known to us what, his, what he's doing because we cannot fully and freely cooperate with him unless we know. And so there's an anthropological foundation here. So Gabriel makes known to Mary, uh, I'm, I'm calling it doctrine, what the doctrine of God's plan and his promises from the Old Testament. And Mary shows us the, the humble way to respond. She knows that he's giving her a new mission, but she knows that this mission is impossible for her to fulfill unless she gets graced in some new way. And we call that grace, the, the grace of divine maternity. Uh, and so it's a, it's a beautiful faith-based way to respond to God. How shall this be? Um, and, uh, and of course, this leads on then the Gabriel explains to her how this shall be through the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit. So Mary is renewed. Her conversion is not from anything sinful, but she has a conversion. She has a renewal that now makes her fit for um, uh, cooperating with God to be the mother of God. And then the rest of her life is spent uh, as the handmaid of the Lord and um, cooperating with her son in the fulfillment of his mission. So you see the three things there. You see uh, doctrinal penetration, revelation, uh, a, a new understanding of God and his ways, a personal renewal to measure up to that mission, and then the mission itself. I think that's very helpful uh, and enlightening about uh, Paul VI's vision for the renewal of the Second Vatican Council. Um, think of our Lord's own ministry. The, 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 uh, most of his life is spent in the ministry of the word, revealing. And then uh, this is, uh, then comes 
uh, his sacrifice on the cross, his passion and resurrection, his priestly ministry, so prophetic ministry, priestly ministry, and then the apostles, the church is renewed like Mary, also through the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, and now the mission takes place, All right? So word, renewal, mission. It's just, it's baked into, I, I think, divine revelation. And, and if you stop to think about the order of the mass, we see exactly the same uh, order. You have the, uh, the liturgy of the word. And uh, in, my own, in my own life, uh, right after the homily, um, so the liturgy of the word, it's a part for the whole, right? You get uh, on Sundays, we get uh, uh, three readings. Um, but the whole is really present in all of the parts. And so um, my little personal devotion is after the homily to, to use the words of Mary. Lord, how shall this be? We just read the Beatitudes. This is beyond me. Uh, or take a passage from St. Paul. You know, Fathers, don't raise your voices with your children. How shall this be? <laughs> um, I'm called to be a, you know, a holy, patient, loving, faithful husband and father. And I mean, that, unless I am overshadowed by the whole, this will never happen. But guess what? Then we move from the liturgy of the word into the liturgy of the Eucharist. And there is another overshadowing the Holy Spirit. Um, and through the power of the Eucharist, I'm transformed, uh, conformed to Christ. And then there's one last thing at the end of Mass, the Great Commission. You see, so I, I think this was, it's just, it's kind of embedded in Catholic culture and thinking that I'm not even sure Paul VI was fully conscious of it, but my instincts are to attempt to explain those three, um, uh, those three paths of the church that way. Yeah, I might say this, that especially from the priest's perspective, he ascends the pulpit to offer the homily, and he's going to use words, he's going to use his intellect, he's going to use truth to speak through the mind to the heart. So we have a hope that the message penetrates, you know, that, that phrase you've offered, doctrinal penetration, he said John the 23rd, that was his phrase, that it penetrates, it passes from the mind 18, inch, 18 inches south into the heart. And then as you have that beautiful devotion or practice after the homily, how can this be? Well, it's just to sort of, how can this be lived in my life, though, the word I've heard today, by the grace of the Spirit, you come to embrace that call, and then you're called to literal communion, and then the communion leads to the commissioning, as you say. So the, the proclamation, the kerygma, the awareness, the consciousness, the doctrinal penetration, leading to personal conversion, a personal yes to to the plan of god revealed to you that day but then you're not left with just that then you are called through that experience of conversion and communion into a a mission field you know at my parish i copy this from another parish on our doors as you leave it says these doors open to a mission field so the the literal sense of the liturgy right go announce the good news you know the, by the glorify god by, by by the way you live your life you literally are walking out the door and it's telling you the mission field awaits you after having received uh, the grace of this this commissioning. So, and I have to say this because we talked with this in the last conversation about the old apologetics was very intellectual, and that's important. Truth is is fundamental. However, um, it's so helpful to to see how the Annunciation, the very first proclamation of the good news, is in the form of a dialogue. You know that the Angelus we pray that dialogue. And that that's always going to be the mode of evangelization, no matter how you come at it. Amen. And and of course, the, the di there's also this dialogue that's interior. And so you can see how important conscience formation is uh, for receptivity to the word. And, and so to ask the question, how shall this be, presupposes, well, it's God I'm talking to. So God, uh, Gabriel says this, all things are possible with God. All right. And, and so there's, there's uh, exercises of the virtue of hope here. So you might say that the three dimensions, the first dimension, doctrinal penetration or awareness, that's faith. Then the conversion, that's hope. And then proclaiming the good news to others, that's charity. 
So you can see there's in our tradition, there's just multiple ways to kind of um, get inside the mind of Paul VI. And especially with regard to the mass, you can, uh, uh, some, some months ago, uh, people were, I was in a group, they were talking about the Eucharistic revival. And I said, well, why don't you just read Ecclesia on Sulam? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, what does that have to do with anything? Well, we kind of uncovered that here. Yeah, and in fact, I will say it uh, explicitly that Father Mike Schmitz, who's this very gifted evangelist, right, that, that Bible in a year priest from the great state of Minnesota, um, he said, you know, I prayed about this talk that I'm about to give, and I kept kept getting the message, call them to repentance for losing the sense of the divine love story. Oh, boy. Basically, call people to repentance. Here are the faithful gathered here in Indianapolis. You obviously have faith. That's why you're here. But I call you and everyone to repentance for losing, if I can say, that doctrinal penetration, that doctrinal awareness, that consciousness, that first proclamation of the good news to you. So um, the, the uh, I just this is so edifying a conversation, and I think I thank you for allowing me to kind of uh, discover yet again how compelling uh, this. Um, this vision is how rooted in scripture and tradition it is, um, and and its and its pastoral potential. Um, you know, uh, so we have this is one. There are many ways. Uh, let's call them models for homilies. But one one thing that all homilists, deacons, priests, and bishops can keep in mind is um, at, at any given moment uh, on any given uh, uh, in any given homily they might want to focus more on explanation and making sure that people understand the doctrine. But, uh, but there should be, a, a, so if that predominates in a homily, can you find some way quickly to connect it with the other two dimensions and say, well, you know, all doctrine is pretty demanding. So this is, yeah, you know, we got to really pray about this and and turn to the Lord for His grace to live up to this. Uh, but oh, how great life is going to be when we live this way, and people will notice. You know, so so uh, it, a homeless. This is kind of a grid. Um, any one of the three is deserving of being the main focus of a given homily. Um, and and I'm not saying that you should, in a stiff way go out of your way always explicitly to connect them, but at least in the homeless mind, they should be connected and there should be a plan to make sure that over time, uh, this, the interaction of the three uh, becomes uh, part of the consciousness of the faithful. Um, We've been speaking today about the practical applications of Ecclesiam Suam, and that's, that's a wonderful practical application for us as priests to preach with this three paths in mind. Uh, I, I, at one point, I, I think it was, I, I mean, my recollection was, I think it was 1997, but I'm not exactly sure. But I think that was a year when the American bishops were um, uh, doing their ad liminas. And, and John, John Paul revolutionized the, the papal uh, teaching office. And uh, he had a plan and he was he was telling the bishops about what Vatican II was all about, what who they are uh, as bishops and everything else. And I began to see that uh, a lot of his uh, um, ad limina addresses, but then I started to see in many of his homilies, uh, or especially w long addresses when he would be in, in Poland or Africa um, and give long talks, um, uh, is structured according to Ecclesiastes Suam. So he brings up some point of doctrine that he thinks is important for this particular church, um, clarifies it almost always with reference to Vatican II, tons of scripture, the saints, um, and uh, and then he'll move into, uh, it's kind of like faith remembers the past, what the church has taught, what God has revealed. Then he moves into the now, and he would often remind his audiences of, uh, so for example, the Afri some African bishops got first on his list, and many countries in Africa were celebrating their centenary um, of Christianity, Catholicism in, in those countries. And so John Paul II was all over the place. 
And, um, and so he start with faith that remembers the past. And that's a beautiful biblical you know, theme, uh, remembering. And remembering what? God's acts of love. And then he would, uh, and so he would talk about the first missionaries. And so he had a research team, obviously, and they names of saints and martyrs and, and uh, all these different types of things. And then he'd say things. I, I noticed that this building is dedicated to St. So-and-so, and you have a Catholic hospital over here. Look how vibrant the faith. It's taken root. It's enculturated here. Uh, you, you have these national holidays and all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, and you have now you have an indigenous clergy. That was always something he'd go out of his way to mention. And then he'd move into the future and he'd say, and now we have to be good stewards of the gift of our faith. And we have to support these institutions and we have to have strong family catechesis, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this was a, once you see this, uh, John Paul opens up in some really quite amazing ways. It, it makes me think of, um, I use a little bit of a grid whenever I'm asked to, to, to teach something. Um, the grid is what is it? So what now, what, right? So it, it's like, well, what's, what's the main point? What are we talking That's about here? So what, what does this have to do with me? Why does this have a bearing on my life? Um, how does the, how does this relate to my happiness? And now what, you know, like, you know, what, what must we do? You know, now that, now that we know this, what must we do? And I think that that'd be a good grid. Uh, another way of thinking about that grid for homilies or just any kind of teaching, yeah. um, whether it's to a crowd or maybe you're having a conversation with someone, if you just kind of keep that in 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 mind, what is it? So what? Now what? So um, you know, there, here's another thing that, but this is very challenging. Okay, so think about retreats. Mm -hmm. uh, when I think about retreats, really good retreats. It kind of follows this. Um, uh, so a good, uh, preacher is going to drill down on some aspect of my vocation. Uh, I understand it better. I feel more accountable. I get to go to confession for falling short in the past. And I, and I set out anew with a, with a new hope for, a, for a, a, a better future. Um, and, uh, and so, so it basically everything always starts with the ministry of the word. This is how missionaries start out, right? The ministry of the word is their witness, uh, both of life, helping the poor, erecting schools, hospitals, um, and then the words that explain that. But, but in, in our established parishes, the, the, one of the greatest pastoral challenges is that right now, there's, there's a whole bunch of people in the parish where grace is primarily working at the level of faith, and need, they need to take in information. They've been uncatechized. They, they need to know the story of God's love, as Father said. But also right now, there's others who were catechized long ago and have been striving to live it. And the way that grace is needing, what they need more than anything else is accompaniment through that death to self conversion. We call it spirituality, okay? And, and so they need to know, they need some guidance on how to pray, what the signs of fruitful prayer are, do's and don'ts and things like that. And then right now in any given parish, there's a bunch of people where, thank God, they've been well catechized. They've had a good sacramental life, a good prayer life, and they're really ready to be called to mission right now. Well, those are three very large balls to keep up in the air all the time in a given parish. But I like the I like Ecclesia on Suum because it at least helps us articulate. I think that really is the pastoral reality out there. And so you can see you can see that so many programs of renewal are doomed to failure because it's one size fits all. And uh, often it's to the lowest common denominator of people who don't know much about their faith and, and it's a call to convert. That's wonderful. But there's really not much in there for the people who, by the grace of God, have been well catechized, taken their faith seriously, and they just they just want to proclaim Christ. They and, and and then proclaiming Christ can take a lot of forms. It can take the form of a ministry for the poor. Uh, it can be verbal evangelization. It can be any number of things. But as I look at, at many parishes and and pastors, many pastors 
uh, uh, tend to kind of major in one of these. Okay. Sure. You know, you've got to have all three. All right. Uh, so you're going to be a priest. You're going to have a sacramental ministry and things like that. But, but some pastors where they're at is kind of where they take their parish with a strong emphasis on missionary outreach. All right. Um, uh, and then there are others who are great teachers. They're homilists and they love catechesis. And so they really focus on the first path, ministry of the word. Um, and uh, so what we need is a, is a robust understanding of all the things that a given diocese and a given parish are doing to facilitate doctrinal penetration, as well as ongoing deep conversion, as well as missionary activity. Professor Bushman, you've had, uh, your career has been deep in the academic world, but you've also had these wonderful opportunities to be in the, the trenches of parish life. So you're, you're getting nearer to the, to the heart of the topic, I think, today, which is the practical applications of Ecclesiam Suum, the paths of the church. Can you say some more and be bold? Don't be, don't, don't hold back about real practical um, applications. Or to say it this way, we understand that the church of 2024 is not the church of 1964 or 1924. And what, what are we missing? It begins with vision, but then vision becomes concrete maybe even structures, maybe in, in a way of, of, of doing ministry, doing apostolate. Can you speak about anything from the littlest idea to the biggest idea about parish life? Because you've been in both academics and parish life. So the word I'm, I'll throw out the word that to announce my response and then develop it, and that's the word charisms, all right? So to, to piggyback on what I just said, in, in, in any uh, parish of a large enough size, there are people who they have a charism of, I'll call it speech, a charism of, so they, they often are catechists. Um, uh, they, they love teaching. They love learning more about their faith. And um, I want to, if I'm a pastor, I want to identify who they are. I want to... Um, uh, make sure that they uh, have a sufficient formation so that I can turn them loose in my parish. Um, in this archdiocese, we have an amazing uh, 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 center for studying the catechism of the Catholic Church run by Jeff Cavins. And it's a two-year program. Uh, so when, you know, it's a pretty serious, uh, robust catechesis for adults. And there are thousands of people in this archdiocese who have gone through that. Well, that's an army of people that can be called to be actively engaged in the ministry of the word at a lot of different levels. Because um, uh, one pastor or a pastor and his associate, along with a, a small staff, are not going to get everything done. All right. Um, and so, so that's that's my instinct. Now, there's also right now in any parish some people who... Uh, are already, uh, they're involved in various kinds of missionary outreach. It could be Meals on Wheels. Uh, it could be uh, something more explicit. Uh, I know some parishes have gone door knocking and invited people to come to uh, an event at the parish. Wh whatever, it's, whatever creative ideas you come up with, I'm all for them. All right. Uh, but again, if we wait until uh, everything's organized through the parish council and through the pastoral staff, um, uh, it, well, uh, if, if the pastoral staff and the parish council are properly in service and understand what they're doing, then they'll understand what I'm talking about by charisms. Okay. Um, and then, then there's people who have a devotion to the Eucharist. They love Eucharistic adoration. Um, uh, they might have a Carmelite background. Uh, they're, they're one of the most predominant ways that, that they manifest their love uh, for the Lord and mission is through liturgy, sacraments, prayer, basically spirituality. So uh, for me, uh, the only hope of really reaching everyone is to uh, discover Vatican II's very significant teaching on the 
place of charisms in the life of the church. So uh, basically, wherever you have a vocation, God will give you the gift or charism that you need in order to fulfill it. Hey, Father, we'll get back to our regularly scheduled conversation shortly. There's something exciting, though, that I need to share with you. The Evangelical Catholic and the Catholic Leadership Institute are hosting a conference specifically for priests like you. The Priests for an Apostolic Age Conference supports mission-minded priests in their quest to bring the gospel to the modern world. This conference will equip you with apostolic vision and tools, and it has a great lineup of speakers, discussions, workshops, and communal worship. Be refreshed by four days of learning, inspiration, and collaboration. Join us January 21st through the 24th in 2025 in San Antonio, Texas, for four days of content, worship, fellowship designed uniquely for you in your priestly vocation. Now. Back to the podcast. John Paul has a great line. Uh, he said that uh, bishops and priests exist in order to, this is the verb he used, activate the baptismal priesthood of the faithful. And, uh, and uh, the place where this is the absolutely most obvious is in the domestic church, the family. It's uh, the, the children are going to be with their parents day in and day out uh, as they go through life, when questions arise uh, from school, on the playground, when someone gets sick, what, whatever. And these are all catechetical moments. So unless the parents can be catechists and unless the parents are exercising their charism, uh, then the domestic church won't be what it's called to be. But, but I think that principle applies then for virtually all of the church's activities, most of the, well, I'll say without an exception, every chapter of Catholic charities in a diocese that I've ever interacted with is the board is filled with people that, that God's called them to this and they've organized themselves and they know who's who and they find other people who are like-minded. And so what you want to do is um, uh, you want to, have a plan so that they stay doctrinally grounded, you know, so they should have an annual retreat or more. Um, uh, if I was a bishop, I would certainly have, a, I would do what John Paul II and, and Benedict did. And, uh, and so for I would have an annual meeting with the heads of major apostolates worldwide. That can be done in the parish and in the diocese as well. Um, so that uh, you're, you're shepherding these people uh, with their various gifts. So, uh, so I'll, I'll uh, stop there and see if that gives rise to any other questions. But I think that day in and day out, uh, I'll just say this, it, most lay people have a really robust uh, spiritual life if they attend daily mass, have maybe a half hour of mental prayer and do some spiritual reading or study of the Bible or Lexio Divina every day. And add to that maybe a rosary uh, chaplet of divine mercy. So that might account for 90 minutes uh, of a lay person's life. The way that Jesus is present to us moment by moment is in fulfilling the duties of our vocation. And that means exercising the charisms that are related to fulfilling our vocation. And so I'd like to see a robust theology and pastoral training with regard to vocation and charism. So I'm gaining really two really very insightful things. One, you mentioned a little bit earlier in your answer about the the three paths of the church and how priests can tend to maybe specialize in one or the other and not always keep an awareness of all three about the the um, doctrinal penetration, that role or that ministry and that approach, the conversion, renewal, and then the apostolic mission that priests can tend to have. Maybe their favorite, but to recognize all three are significantly important. And then as you speak now, I, I hear the phrase in my mind, the unleashing of the, of the charisms, the unleashing of the charism, charisms in, in the faithful gathered in front of you week after week in, in Sunday Mass. And Peter and I have had great conversations about that governance in the church is not just about administration of the temporal, which is included, but the governance is even more importantly, the governing of the charisms and the attending to the charisms of the people and 
doing whatever priests and staff and parish leadership can do to to activate what a great try like you're pressing a button and it turns on you know yes uh uh thank you for that that nice summary and um the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Articles 306 and 307, uh, go to they, they elaborate, so to speak, on this idea of activating. It's uh, at Article 306 of the Catechism paraphrases a passage from Saint Thomas. It talks about the dignity of being causes. Hmm. I, you know, talk if you got a philosophical background, you you just wow. I mean, this is God's prerogative. He's the cause of causes, but we're made in his image and likeness. So guess what? He doesn't even hold on to causality as a divine prerogative. He shares it with us. Um, and so that's Article 306. And 307 it, uh, develops this by referring to, I think it's three passages in St. Paul where um, uh, various people are called God's co-workers or collaborators. All right. Um, there's an interesting textual variant on one of those passages, by the way. Um, uh, you can see that that was kind of a scandalous idea to some scribe who was copying Paul's letter to the, the Thessalonians. Um, and, and so it, instead of God's co-workers, it's God's servants. And just as an interesting point, <laughs> that's, the, that's the preferable translation for most of the Protestant theologians that I've read and people that I've talked to, they have a hard time with mediation uh, and, and us really being collaborators with God. But that's just kind of an interesting little sideline. So the, uh, I, wish that the, I wish that Cardinal Schoenborn, uh, he was the uh, secretary redactor of the catechism when he was Father Schoenborn, well, he was one of my professors at the University of Freiburg. <laughs> and, uh, and so um, there's a lot of passages in there. I go, I know where that came from. Um, and so th I mentioned that th uh, this idea comes from St. Thomas, but apparently he decided not to quote St. Thomas when it's kind of a philosophical point, but only with regard to truly theological points. Anyway, um, I wish he had just added one more line and and made it very clear, when we talk about our causality, we're just talking about love, okay? Uh, to the, and, and this has really important implications for what I think is a typical American, it's in our culture, it's in our DNA, we're doers. Uh, and, and if we're not strong enough to do it with our arms, we'll invent hydraulics. And if that's not enough, we'll unleash the power of the atom. And but we get things, we think in terms of efficient causality. Douglas, I, I'm going to interrupt for just a second. I, I was totally hoping you were going to go here because this was going to be my next question. The the whole causality thing, instrument or uh, exemplary and efficient. This is this is great. All right, so keep going. So, <laughs> so when we talk about instruments, which we are, uh, that's aligned with efficient causality. Okay. Uh -huh. um, However, in the new evangelization, if and, and 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 when we talk about a witness, the church is thinking primarily in terms of final causality. That when someone you said this in your own words earlier, Peter, uh, or in the last segment, you said uh, when people see the unity and joy and mutual service in a beautiful Catholic family or in a religious community or among clergy uh, or, or whatever, they, we're, you, you're not going to get that at the Mall of America, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to get that in, in, in most of our cultural events. And, and so it's the joy of knowing that you're loved. It's being so full of God's love that you can you, you can go through life bringing things into relationships rather than being utilitarian and basically sizing all people up. What am I going to get out of this? And just as an aside, that was my wife's and my vision for married life. Uh, we, we thought that if we loved our children, uh, introduced them to Christ and his church and all the saints, um, that they, that they would be so, um, humanly sewn together and so rich that when they go through life, 
more people who are unloved could get loved. Okay. Uh, we need all kinds of people. It's not their fault. They're wounded. They need to be loved. And, and so we're going to do that. But boy, do we need an army of people who've been so fully loved by Christ that they go through life loving others. And so it's that. So, but you see, we are, this is where I think that um, so many programs, methods, techniques, uh, manipulating the uh, kind of institutional infrastructure of the church, that, that's all on the side of efficient causality. Mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. be good stewards of all of this, right? Mm-hmm. I, this is really, if, um, if Google can be, uh, can be uh, productive on all these institutional levels, our mission's higher than that. Okay, so we so we need to be experts with regard to all that stuff, but that's all at the service of conversion, and uh, and people are going to convert when they see a higher definition of happiness at work in someone's life. That's how that's how parents evangelize. They live a happy life, and children grow up saying, "Well, that's how I want." They they might not say it for a long time, but they're thinking, "That's a good way to live." Uh, our children, when they went to college, um, they saw so much misery. They, 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 they just, that's when they started saying, mom and dad, we are so thankful. Our, all of our friends, our classmates, our teammates are, they're miserable people. They're, they're so needy and, and they're so confused. Um, and, uh, and so here's an example of new evangelization. Division one swimmer. This is our oldest son, Luke. Monday, this is a uh, Monday of, uh, he gives me a call and he says, dad, you won't imagine what happened. I said, well, tell me. He said, well, we were on a, a, a trip and I reminded the coach about NCAA regulations. I, he's got to let me get to church on Sunday. And one of the teammates noticed and said, you know, Bushman, you always say that, you know, and, uh, you know, I haven't been to mass in years. Um, I, I kind of, I, I'd feel awkward just going, could I go with you? So that's Monday, all right? People notice. This is just a, a, a 19-year-old doing what he was brought up to do. And, uh, and, and he's, not, he's not, he has no plan to evangelize. It's final cause alley. This, mm-hmm. this kid's, his teammate's conscience got pricked by watching a teammate. Okay, two days later, John swimming at another division one school dad same language you won't believe what happened i thought Gee, maybe i will except for for john it was one of the assistant coaches <laughs> bushman uh i haven't been to mass this is a great story i'll finish it quickly but i haven't been to mass can i you know can i would you go with me yeah uh and then john uh said well now if it's been that long since you've been to mass if you want to receive Holy Communion, you, there's something else you should do. And he said, what? And he didn't know. John said, well, you need to go to confession. This is a great. And, and so the coach said, well, will you go with me? And John, <laughs> and John said, I can get you to the door, but I can't go in. <laughs> so I always think of in the two days apart, that's new evangelization. People sure. are watching. And seeds of the word that were planted in them when they were younger, if they're Catholics and haven't practiced their faith for all, all it takes is an example in some cases for mm-hmm. them to have a moment of truth and conscience. Yep. Final causality. Yeah. So to just to spell this out, final causality, meaning that when I live as a witness, I become like an exemplar, and that gives someone um, a vision so that that e- an exemplary cause, I suppose. Um, and, and that gives this person a vision, which is a final cause. It's something I want to shoot for. I, I appeal to their desire for happiness. I want that. And, and now this person has a new final cause and it moves in that direction. I, so I'm, I'm a, a bit zealous about this topic right now because I see this all, I see this all the time. This is one of the, this is one of, I would say the, the primary errors that I see out there in, in, in parish life and church world right now. There's an overemphasis on efficient causality 
to the neglect of exemplary causality. No one would say it that way, and no one even thinks this way, really. And here's what I mean. We oftentimes think that we can just train people up, okay? Give a training on small group facilitation. Give a training on the kerygma. Give a workshop on um, organizational health, all these things. Now, these are all good. Now, that lies within this realm of efficient causality, right? There's help someone to become a, a more efficient cause, a more skilled, um, a, a more skilled practitioner, uh, and and have at it, right? Um, and while while it's important and good that we give people training and skills, the problem is when 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 those training and skills are taken outside of the context of proper spiritual formation, long-term formation, you're reducing it to manipulation of human techniques and skills. And the problem is you can't train people up into zeal, okay? It's that radiation of love. You just can't train people into zeal. And so when the training doesn't work, when it doesn't work, we move to another training or another workshop. And and it it kind of... Yeah, what you end up with is a sort of a ministry ADHD, so to speak, where you're jumping from training to training and workshop to workshop, and we don't go deep enough on the level of personal conversion and long-term deep formation. And and the the witness, the personal witness is never developed because that person doesn't, they don't grow in a a, a conversion that's deep enough that love actually begins to transform the person. So I, I, I feel like, and in, in, straighten me out here if I'm, I'm, I'm speaking out of, uh, uh, out of order here, but trainings, workshops, good, great. There's been a lot of great development in pedagogy and everything else. But I feel like there's kind of broadly speaking um, a neglect of deeper, longer-term formation in holiness and personal conversion. And with the emphasis now, the emphasis, again, is on efficient causality, whereas we need to work on exemplary causality, which is converted into final causality, and that comes through a life of ongoing conversion and holiness. Now, you give those people various skills trainings and things like that, and they play, it's placed within the proper context. and. Um, but I think this is one of the, the, the one of the primary errors today is in the, is thinking we can just train people up into zeal, train people up into holiness. It'll come from a workshop. It'll come from a, a, a training. But it, the reality is, I think it needs to it it needs to be deeper and longer term than that. And those trainings and workshops have their place within the context. I don't know. Can can you can you and this by the way sorry uh, now I'm I'm um, getting all excited this by the way I think is related to the notion of co-responsibility okay um, with Pope Benedict co that that the laity have a co-responsibility along with the clergy uh, for the building of the church and the mission of the church because that's based on the reality that we're all causes. Um, we're not just participating in the mission of the hierarchy, um, but we have, we have, you could say, our own jurisdiction or our own post, so to speak, in the church. Um, I don't know. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut myself off right there because now I'm now, now I'm I'm starting to get all all over the place. But can can you speak to that a little bit? Or well, correct like me where I'm getting this wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. I like the balance. Uh, there is, there are, there's a lot of practical wisdom in our church. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I mentioned Jeff Caven's Institute on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. He also has an institute um, on, I can't remember, the, on evangelization. But and, but he goes, he gives people nuts and bolts about how to start a conversation. Sure. Super into helpful. a certain direction. So there's tons of wisdom out there. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, a lot of the, our poor church lost treasure troves of wisdom 
um, that was taken for granted when these great religious orders, I'll just talk about uh, teaching religious orders. Um, so you've got a, a gal who becomes a, a Dominican right out of high school and, and she's living with and she's having lunch with these uh, Dominican sisters who have been teaching for 50 years. And they, the, the wisdom they passed on uh, non-systematically was amazing. And nobody chronicles it. I mean, we're, mm. we, I mean I, I, there, are, there are books out there. I've seen some of them, but you see the point that I'm trying to make. So <laughs> anytime there's an act of apostolate or exercise of charism, there's uh, experience gives rise to a lot of wisdom about don't do this. It never works. Uh, this is something that always works. Here's some things that sometimes work, so, you know, and so it, we need that information sharing, yes. but, it should, but it should come, as you say, within um, the universal call to holiness. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for me, uh, uh, there are others who lamented the kind of professionalism, professionalization of theology. Uh, someone like Hanser from Baltazar, uh, that might be for people who are familiar with him, that might resonate a little bit. Um, and most lay theologians, most lay people who have, have studied theology were never, uh, some of them were in a seminary for a while. Some of them might have started out in a religious order and discerned out. But many, many of them never entered into one of the deep spiritual traditions of our, of our church. And it shows in their theology. It's a bunch of mind games. It's not mm -hmm. ordered to, and it's, it's not alive. Um, and it's, it's not their fault but they're doing a lot of damage. Uh, it, it's bad. It's often bad theology. Um, it, it, it caters more to the, 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 the requirements of accreditation than it does to the requirements of the church's mission, you know, and so publish or perish, you know, um, well, it takes a lot of effort and time to get a doctorate and then uh, publish an awful lot. Uh, would you rather have people who publish a lot or people who have scabs on their knees? Um, yeah. teaching, teaching in your seminaries, you see. Well, but our seminaries want to be uh, accredited. So we've got to have people with PhDs. Fine. But that boy, it's a small pool to choose from then if you want holy PhD theologians who also have pastoral experience and can therefore tailor the court, the formation of priests to the life they're going to live. Uh, both to their call to holiness as priests and then to their pastoral ministry. So, um, uh, so I'm I I uh, we're kind of living in a golden age of pastoral theology, but much of it is oriented towards putting I think way too much hope in if we're just clever enough, uh, if if we just hire enough MBAs, we'll have a new springtime in the church. Sure, sure. And I'm not going to mention any names, uh, but there are some well known very wealthy Catholic businessmen who made a lot of money early in life and they love the church so much. And so they've started uh, one thing or another, and it all boils down to managing the infrastructure of the church. Well, it, if you do that well, I'm all for it. If that's going to free father from a, a, a lot of other things, um, uh, that's what they know best. Um, but the church is first and foremost, talk about definitions, the church is first and foremost the bride of Christ and his mystical body um, and the family of God. Those are the images that predominate in the catechism of the Catholic church. But the vast majority of Catholics, when you say church, they think of hierarchy, mm -hmm. parish council, uh, rightly they think of the liturgy, um, but more of, a, of a something that you do on Sundays. Um, it's the visible part of the church that they're thinking about. Um, I think that we need to be very clear-minded about this. If Jesus delays in coming for several hundred years, we are the first generation, generations, to have to deal with post-Christian culture in an extremely advanced society of economics, education, and um, uh, uh, industry um, and technology. So um, can we save the developing countries? Can, what mistakes have we made? Can someone document this? Because as they develop, 
we don't want them to start putting all their hope in just the human side of the church, the institutional side of the church. Um, so, so we're we're ice breaking here. This is a kind of an exciting time to be a Catholic in North America, um, and I, I just think we need to get all the right people together and have a conference about the subject. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's again, it's about it's about balance, right? On the one hand, we can't reduce the the mission of the church to the manipulation of techniques and and processes and processes and methods. Um, that that strips the church, and I'm quoting you in, in your book, I believe, I don't know if it's a footnote or if it's in the text, that strips the church of her supernatural mission when we, when we do that. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, um, it would be an error to simply ignore the great developments of of business and skill and 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 um, you know, I don't know, interpersonal, techniques and whatnot. These are things that have to be correctly harmonized and subordinated, right? So these, these human things, grace builds on nature, right? Um, but so, so we got to work on developing the nature, um, but it also heals the nature. So there's, there's a great harmonization. I mean, never before in the history of the church have, have we had so much, you know, um, I don't know, technical wisdom and experience and expertise at our fingertips the trick is harmonizing it correctly. Benedict XVI uh, said it in one simple sentence. That was one of his gifts, right? He had <laughs> all this wisdom, and he could somehow condense it into uh, one or two sentences. He said, the challenge is to make all of the church's visible institutions transparently sacramental pointing towards love. We're, we're back to the, the last... Uh, conversation that we had. Uh, the fundamental good news is the good news of God's merciful love. And so uh, one of the things I love doing, um, and I think I saw this in uh, in, in your white paper, uh, I think you quoted Catechism of the Catholic Church 773. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, everything in the church that's a uh, human, visible, institutional uh, is at the service of holiness, which is measured by uh, the love of the bride for the bridegroom. Mary is goes before us all, um, and and so one of here's a small concrete. Uh, uh, Father invited me little as well as big picture stuff. <laughs> um, laminate seven seventy three of the Catechism for all of your parish staff. Uh, uh, this, if it's not your mission statement, it's so close to it. It's the theological foundation for every employee of the church. And everyone who's exercising a charism in some significant way um, should memorize that that 773. There are other passages that might be better, but I'm just saying, uh, don't invert means over ends. Always keep the end in mind. And so uh, every employee of the church, everyone exercising a charism should have a working definition of what holiness is. Could you give us one? Sorry? Could you give us one, a working definition of holiness? Well, it depends on who I'm talking. There's lots of ways to explain <laughs> something like holiness, right? So, but but holiness is the perfection of charity. All right. Um, by the way, here, here's a, this is so interesting. You, when you look at Bible studies, you know, one of the common ways of defining holiness is separation, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Consecrated and set aside. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, well, Vatican II and John Paul II and Benedict XVI went out of their way to say, well, to the, there's a certain truth, but who are you set aside for? For God. Who's God? God is love. So holiness and consecration is missionary, you see. Um, and, and so you don't build walls to protect yourself from the, the world. You go out into the world in order to evangelize it. Holy people do that. All right. So, um, so. What is holiness? What are the means to holiness? And what are the fruits and signs of holiness? Every single person who's involved in the church's life uh, should have ready answers to that. I've been doing this for over 40 years. When I go into a parish or a diocese to do a you know, day of recollection or retreat, whatever you want to call it. And so I ask people, they have no idea what holiness is. I mean, they, they do because they've got models of saints and it's very, but it's inarticulate, you mm-hmm. see. 
And so, so when I've talked to priests, um, so how are the poor faring in your parish, Father, a pastor? You know, and for some priests, oh my gosh, Bushman's one of those liberals. Here we go with the social gospel. <laughs> well, don't worry about that with Bushman, okay? But it, it, that's just one measure, okay? How are the poor faring? You know what it says in the Acts of the Apostles? I think it comes from Deuteronomy. Uh, it's in that passage where they shared all the, they put all their belongings at the feet of the apostles. And then it, it, it's a beautiful line. There were no poor among them. It's a direct quotation from Deuteronomy. There shall be no poor among you. All right. Mm -hmm. So, so th this is, of course, the social gospel is important. It's as important as the uh, miracles of healing were in Jesus's ministry. All right. Uh, but how many, how about confessions? You know, uh, not only the quantity of confessions, but the quality of confessions. So I, I don't want to necessarily toot my horn, but there was a I was I was invited to do a retreat in a diocese um, that included clergy and lay leadership, and um, and I I did my version of the grand narrative of God's merciful love, mercy is God's greatest attribute, and apparently a number of people kind of heard the gospel in a way they never heard it before. And so, so the bishop invited me to come back several more times because of the word he got about an uptick in confessions and the quality of confessions and, and reconciliation between the bishop and someone who was a real thorn in his side. See, my, I'm just ministry of the word. I'm just a theologian. I, I just try to let God speak for himself. But God had these people prepared. The Holy Spirit had them prepared to hear my message, and it bore fruit. So if I can, so uh, uh, there are people with that kind of charism. Father John Ricardo, everywhere he goes, good things happen. Father Mitch Pacwa, he's getting uh -huh. older now, and he's had a heart attack. I, got, I know I, he can't get out like he used to, but... Uh, I would always say to people, you don't know what else to do. Get Pacwa in there. Wherever he goes, good things happen. So <laughs> not just not just uh, charisms in the parish and the diocese, but also charisms elsewhere that have proven themselves. But here's the, here's another pastoral piece. If you're going to bring in Pacwa or Ricardo, um, have a plan to follow up on the momentum. Yes. We, 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 uh, usually the pastor and the staff need a week off after a major event because they're the ones who did all the planning and everything else, right? There's no possibility for a follow-up with the momentum. And, and that, that really, really uh, um, stresses my heart um, that there is lots of momentum that takes place and it's squandered. Yeah, that's what I call the golden question in ministry. The golden question is, then what? Yeah. Whenever you're going to do anything and any kind of an event, a retreat, a speaker, a 12 week series, whatever it is, got to be asking yourself this question. Then what? How are we going to to ride? How are we going to to foster and facilitate this part of ecclesial governance? Right. How are we going to foster and facilitate, you know, the charisms that are stirred up and the 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 conversions that that have taken place? How are we going to accompany people into deeper levels of of conversion and missionary activity right. so another so another card that, uh, with that needs to be laminated <laughs> yeah, and so you know i know how to use the kennedy directory and so wherever i wherever i go in to give a talk i first look at you know the kennedy directory over a few years to look at trends and and all what the numbers look like and everything else um but uh i i want to uh um i want to know where the major apostolates are so that if I give a talk and someone says, oh, my gosh, what you said about St. John of the Cross was, uh, and I said, you know, you got, you have a third order Carmelite group just around the corner, you know, uh, or, if, or if someone is moved by something that someone else says or that I say and they, uh, about charismatic renewal, it's helpful to, here's a phone number, here's their address, uh, here's their email address. That That's not hard to do, you know, um, but uh but we're not good at that. And so that's another kind of ask anybody who's in sales uh, and, and who's that, who has that practical wisdom, we can learn. And that's a practical thing for me. Um, and so I, that's what I've spent most of my time 
uh, or I shouldn't say that, but a lot of my time is trying to direct people to an established apostolate, is in good standing with the bishop, uh, has borne fruit over the years, and I trust them if there's a mix between this person's, uh, where Grace is working in this person's life and what they're doing. Wonderful. Well, I think we are coming up to the end of our time here together. Well, thank you, Douglas, again, so much for being with us today and, and last week. And and thank you, all you priests out there for listening. Um, this has been great for me. Um, let's close with prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, my God, for the good inspirations, affections, and resolutions that you've communicated to us in this conversation. We ask you, Lord, for the grace to put them into effect. Our Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, our guardian angels, pray for pray us. For In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peter and Father, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Peter.